Hi. Did you know there was a time when there was no income tax in the United States? This is Bill Federer, and in this episode of How We Got Here, we're going to look at some interesting history of income taxes. Originally, the U.S. Constitution prohibited a direct federal income tax. Article 1, Section 9, no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid. If there was no income tax, how did the federal government get its funding? The U.S. Constitution allowed two sources of revenue for the federal government. The first was excise taxes, paid on specific items like salt, tea, tobacco, alcohol. And the second was tariff taxes on imports called customs. The Coast Guard was formed by Alexander Hamilton to catch those trying to smuggle goods into America without paying tariffs. The Coast Guard's fast ships, called revenue cutters, caught smugglers and collected revenue. Tariff taxes made foreign goods more expensive, so people would buy less of them, choosing instead to buy American-made goods. American goods were mostly manufactured in factories located in the northern states. Factories used water or steam power to run mills and spinning jennies, motorized looms which wove cotton into cloth. Factories mass-produced items from shoes to farm equipment to muskets and rifles. The northern states liked tariffs because they made European goods, such as cloth and textiles, more expensive, resulting in consumers buying more of their American-made products. The southern states did not like tariffs, as they had very few factories. The south was mostly agricultural, which unfortunately was based on slave labor. The South then had to either buy more expensive goods from the northern factories or more expensive goods from Europe due to the tariffs. At one point, nearly 90% of the federal government's income came from tariff taxes collected at southern ports. This created tensions between the North and the South. In 1832, South Carolina even threatened to secede. South Carolina's port at Charleston had a Union fort, Fort Sumter, which ensured tariffs were collected. The Civil War started in 1861 when Confederates fired cannons at Fort Sumter. Once the war started, the federal government no longer had access to Southern tariff income. Lincoln, Lincoln then pushed through an emergency income tax to raise $750 million to pay for the Union war effort. <clears throat> After the war, the income tax was repealed because the emergency of the war was over. Northern factories grew even more successful after the Civil War, while Americans experienced the fastest rise in the standard of living in history. Factory owners, called industrialists, became very wealthy. They were nicknamed robber barons. Over in Europe, a German writer named Karl Marx published his book Das Kapital in 1867. He used what he called critical theory to divide society into groups and then pit them against each other. Business owners and workers, oppressors and victims, haves and have-nots, Marxists would organize protests, riots, and violence to overthrow the ruling class. Marx gave very little thought as to who would be in charge once the ruling class was overthrown. He imagined that somehow, out of the chaos, an idyllic utopian socialist society would magically emerge. Unfortunately, the reality was violent gangs seized power, doling out favors to their deep state supporters and canceling their opponents. Marx's ideology filtered across the ocean into America with German immigrants. 
socialist leader Lenin is credited with saying, the way to crush the bourgeoisie, the business owners, is to grind them between the millstones of taxation and inflation. German immigrants pushed for an income tax on the wealthy industrialists. In contrast to Europe, America did not have centuries of ruling class elites who passed wealth from one generation to the next. For the most part, America's wealthy started out with nothing and in one lifetime rose out of poverty to success. In 1892, Marxist thinking resulted in not just unions being formed, but the effort to have an income tax on industrialists. But the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional in the 1894 decision of Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust. Chief Justice Melville Fuller said income tax should only be used during a wartime emergency. The original expectation was that the power of direct taxation would be exercised only in extraordinary exigencies, emergencies. Justice Stephen Field added, the income tax law under consideration is class legislation. Whenever a distinction is made in the burdens a law imposes or in the benefit it confers on any citizen, by reason of their birth or wealth or religion, it is class legislation and leads inevitably to oppression and abuses. The push to tax industrialists resulted in President Theodore Roosevelt pushing through the inheritance tax as only the extreme wealthy had an inheritance worth leaving. Then President William Taft pushed through a 2% corporate income tax, as only the extreme wealthy owned corporate stock. Then President Woodrow Wilson was elected. He thought tariff taxes between countries caused wars, and that if all the tariffs were removed, there would be world peace. To replace the lost tariff income, Wilson pushed through the personal income tax in 1913 with the 16th Amendment. It originally was just a 1% tax on the top 1% richest people, such as Rockefeller, Carnegie, Astor, Getty, Vanderbilt, Fisk, Flagler, Gould, Harriman, J.P. Morgan, and Schwab. That would be like today only taxing the likes of Bill Gates, George Soros, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Fink, and Jeff Bezos. But there was a problem. The wealthy are not wealthy because they're dumb, but because they're smart. No sooner did the income tax get enacted than the wealthy found a way not to pay it by forming tax-free foundations. This way, they could still control their wealth, they just weren't taxed on it. Their tax-free nonprofit educational foundations were included in a tax category that previously had only been for churches. Churches did not pay taxes because they were essentially gatherings of individuals who had already paid their taxes. Besides, churches did all the social work. They started hospitals, medical clinics, schools, orphanages, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, benevolence, inspected bottled milk for contamination, cared for the widows, unwed mothers, war veterans, maimed, juvenile delinquents, immigrants, and visited shut-ins and those in prison. Churches provided all these social services largely for free, with no help from the government, because they had a religious motivation. This later changed during the Great Depression with Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal and with Lyndon Johnson's Great Society Welfare State, when the government usurped this role from the church. World War I fighter, uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, who owned the Indianapolis Speedway, wanted to repeal the 16th Amendment income tax, stating, When Woodrow Wilson told us the evils of concentrated power, less than 9% of our entire national income was enough to keep all the federal and local governments going. By 1960, taxes took one-third of all our earnings, 
the entire gross income of every American is subject to complete federal confiscation. Rickenbacker continued, every time the liberals discover a brand new misinterpretation of the Constitution, every time they invent a new way to circumvent the constitutional limits of federal power, they pile up more power in Washington at the expense of individual liberty across the land. Instead of advocating freedom, modern liberals are striving to pile up the power of government in Washington. President Gerald Ford stated, October 19th, 1974, what they don't tell us when they promise all these benefits that they are going to give you from our government is that a government big enough to give us everything we want is a government big enough to take from us everything we have. There was another practical benefit of churches to society. Churches help maintain strong marriages and families, encourage a moral and responsible population, all of which translated into safer neighborhoods. From the 1930s to the 1970s, regular church attendance in the United States was over 70%. Without the support of churches, there are more broken marriages, more fatherless children, more crime, drug abuse, homelessness, declining property values, which decreased the tax base, requiring taxes to be raised to pay for more police and firemen. Lo and behold, there was a great financial repercussions to de-Christianizing society. When World War I started, the wartime emergency allowed income tax to be expanded. This followed the precedent of an income tax during a wartime emergency. Then, during the emergency of World War II, Franklin Roosevelt instituted the largest tax increase in history, requiring nearly everyone to pay. John F. Kennedy explained, April 20th, 1961, in meeting the demands of war finance, the individual income tax moved from a selective tax imposed on the wealthy to the means by which the great majority of our citizens participate in paying. The World War II patriotic fervor was displayed on billboards with slogans such as, Uncle Sam needs you, buy war bonds, and smash the axis, pay your taxes. There was a problem, though. Taxes were paid at the end of the year, but nobody saved up money to pay them. Beardsley Rummel, chairman of Macy's Department Store and director of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, promoted the idea of withholding taxes from people's paychecks. Kennedy explained, withholding on wages and salaries was introduced during the war when the income tax was extended to millions of new taxpayers. Whenever you see money taken out of your paycheck, now you know that it's left over from the emergency of World War II. Once the majority of the country was paying income taxes, it became an easy way to begin implementing socialism through the back door. Liberal politicians would take money in taxes away from their conservative opponents and then funnel the money as welfare payments to support their liberal voters who would then re-elect them to keep the free stuff coming. England's Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. As income taxes increased, industrialists were smart. They realized they could avoid taxes by moving their factories overseas to places like China, where there was cheaper labor. When factory owners left, their patriotism left with them, and they became globalists. Globalists would then give money to politicians to get them to lower the tariff taxes so they could bring their cheaper foreign-made goods back into America, making it even more difficult for companies located in America to compete. Kennedy added April 20th, 1961, countries where income taxes are lower than in the United States provides a tax advantage for companies operating through overseas subsidiaries that is not available to companies operating solely in the United States. Kennedy observed February 6th, 1961, 
present tax laws may be stimulating an undue amount of flow of American capital to industrial countries abroad. To remedy this, Kennedy proposed a stimulus plan of lowering taxes across the board September 18, 1963. A tax cut means higher family income and higher business profits and a balanced federal budget. Every taxpayer and his family will have more money left over after taxes for a new car, a new home, new conveniences, education, and investment. Every businessman can keep a higher percentage of his profits in his cash register or put it to work expanding or improving his business. And as the national income grows, the federal government will ultimately end up with more revenues. Taxes became more complicated. Albert Einstein's accountant, Leo Mattesdorf, wrote in Time Magazine 1963, one year, while I was at his Princeton home preparing his tax return, Miss, Mrs. Einstein asked me to stay for lunch. During the course of the meal, Professor Einstein turned to me and with his inimitable chuckle said, the hardest thing in the world to understand is income taxes. Ronald Reagan stated in 1988, I believe God did give mankind unlimited gifts to invent, produce, and create. And for that reason, it would be wrong for government to devise a tax structure that suppresses those gifts. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of How We Got Here and the brief overview of the interesting history of income taxes. God bless you.